Right in the back. This is Clay. Yes. <laughs> well, there he is. 
Clay in the back. Clay Eels. Uh, yes. Thank you, Clay. Clay is the Clay was instrumental in setting up this event, and we really appreciate the opportunity. Thanks, Clay. This is our seventh or eighth show so far. We've got it down, so when you hear something that sounds sincere, it's not. It's <laughs> true. <laughs> but here's how we've been beginning each of these shows. So of course out of the Helix, Paul became a concert promoter and, and uh, 
many of you will, many of you actually will remember the Sky River Festival. And uh, in fact, we always ask, Rio Head, how many attended? Can we get a, oh, I see, one, two, three, four, five. You have a flashlight holded up. If I had, I have a laser, but I don't want to point it out anymore. What's that? I sold you. Wonderful, wonderful. Did you pay for them? So of course the Sky River Festival often became known. Well, here's Paul in his saffron robe with Tom Robbins at the at Sky River. How do you know who Tom Robbins is? Raise your hand. Turn your flashlights on. And then we're going to move forward. Oh, and this is the. I, uh, and I, 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 first, I have to apologize for using a word that Paul hates, but this is an iconic photo of Sky River. I don't know, I, can, I, I do this often, I just give him a little, there he goes there. Because it was also called Mud River. It rained a lot. Yeah. Well, several months before he started his column in the, uh, on January 17th, 1982, Paul actually produced 294 glimpses of historic Seattle, its neighborhoods and neighborhood businesses. <coughs> And he sold it for a penny a photo. It's 294 cents for this book. And you sold how many copies? 30, 40, we claim 40,000. 40,000. Because you see, when you order them from the printer, you, you usually order you know, 10,000. But this thing was so popular because there's nothing like it before. And uh, it just worked out wonderfully. So we sold 40,000 of them. I don't think there's any left. Any of you got this book? Any? Raise your hand. Well, several people do, yeah. Several. If you don't want it, please bring it back to me. You gave them out at Halloween that year. I gave them out at Halloween that year? You did that? No, oh, I did. Well, that kind of spoils the notion of their demand, doesn't it? Weren't you asked to come here and do the video tonight? <laughs> Tom said, thank you very much. So, within a few months of, of this book coming out and being sold, uh, Paul started his, his Seattle Times column. And in the process of doing the Times column, he, he found a, actually before then, he found a wonderful fellow as his mentor. And many of you may remember Murray Morgan. Okay, raise your hands if you remember Murray Morgan. How many of you have read a book of Murray Morgan's? Raise your hands. Uh, how many have read Skid Road? Oh, we yeah. have. Okay, that's good. It's, it's just, it's, re it's, it's up in print, no print again. So it's never gone out of print, but they just reprinted it. What a wonderful book. What a wonderfully written book. Go out and read it a second time. Have you bought four of our volumes? Because you'll need one for yourself, one for your children, one for your parents, one for your neighbor. Anything else? No, that's it. <laughs> for your dog. No, no, Gene, come on. That, that trivializes the significance of your own. No, no. Well, this is a wonderful, this is a photo that I threw into the show because I've always, I've always loved to see Paul in the uh, early mid 80s and here he is looking across uh, a dining room table at Lucy Campbell Coe who when she was a young girl witnessed the Seattle fire which I think is a new moment and I don't think there are any witnesses left I think you you interviewed at least four or five of them didn't you four I remember and I was just starting and, and they were all 90 or more like Lucy. She was quite a wonderful person. But, uh, so we jump, there we are, you and I, Gene. There we are. We jumped to 2011. We did a show at Mohai together, and I'd been working with Paul. We already brought out a book four years before called Washington, then and now, done for an out of state publisher. And so we assembled our collection of uh, current then and now's, now and then's, and uh, Mohai gave us a big room 
and we brought our friend Marangere over, who took this photo from Paris, and she filled the foyer with Paris now and then photos. So here's Berenger and the two of us. And a few years before we did the Moai show, we visited Berenger in Paris, and, and we shot a little video, and it starts with Paul holding the camera, and let's, I, I won't say anything more. This is really a very touching video, and it might be hard for you, some of you, to control it. Oh, that's incredible. Yeah, he looks very much like me, doesn't he? He does. With the glasses, with the glasses. <laughs> take, the, take this video. Okay. This was taken from the corner 
uh, first in Cherry. And I went back and we, we haven't had a snow quite that deep for quite a while now. And we've never had a snow that deep. But I went back when it was snowing and I took flakes at first in Cherry. Do you want to apologize for that? Or do I apologize for our lack of snow? I have to say that what I tried to do in over the last couple of years is to find something that would in some way reference or, or coincide or even match the historical photo. And a couple times I came close. Let's go forward. This is a lovely photo taken by the great uh, Norwegian photographer Anders Vilsa uh, at the foot of Pike Street in the late 1890s. And uh, Vilsa, uh, after spending less than a decade in Seattle, went back to Norway. And Paul tells the story of his, of his wife. Well, his wife went first. And then they agreed that he would come and join her, which he did. And then she refused to return to him to Seattle. She made him stay with her there in Norway. So that was the end of his time in Seattle, which lasted about nine years. But it was a good decision. His wife was right, as they usually are. And uh, what happened to him? Well, he returned to Norway and became the great uh, Norwegian living treasure until about 1940. He was, a, he was a major photographer in Norway. And the photographs he took on the streets of Seattle sort of are, they, you can see the germination of, of this extraordinary talent. So I went back to this location, and let's see if we can, here we are, right about the fountain. Now that really happens to be also Gene's favorite subject, or one of his favorite subjects. Those are kids that go to the school where he teaches, Hillside School in, in the town of Bellevue, Washington, some of you heard of it. And uh, anybody live here in the crew here that lives in Bellevue? You do? That explains it. Yeah. Really <laughs> anybody else? <laughs> I'm sorry. Don't worry. Okay. So this is another Anders Vilsa photo, uh, looking at, uh, with his back to Columbia Street, and uh, he's looking along north along Railroad Avenue, and this is a waterfront gold rush scene, probably 1898, might be 99. Um, the flooring here isn't solid ground, but very worn and planking, and if you look up here, you can see aluminum houses weighing only 150 pounds for sale, to those traveling to the Yukon. And they would, with some strength and alacrity, they could hoist them on their back. And, and in that winter and spring of 98, 107 ships sailed for the Klondike. And there we are today. That's the Marion Street overpass where you go uh, underneath the that doomed structure called the, well, what is the name of that doomed structure? Viaduct. That's right, okay, all of those who are in favor of it being destroyed, raise your hands. <coughs> all of those who wish to keep it, raise your hands. Sort of about even divide. I know there's a lot of undecideds here. I have limited Paul to five votes tonight. <laughs> I think we've done, how many have we done? I think we've done three so far. Okay. Now, I would like to know, and this is not a question, this, this is, doesn't relate at all to my five. I would like to know, where in the hell does he think he comes from? Telling me how many times I can ask for a vote. Let me know that, okay? I'll just pull your mic. <laughs> the power of the mic. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Oh, so, Anders Vilsa was celebrated recently in a series of stamps. Norway. And if you get a chance, just do a quick search of his name because he really did some spectacular portraits of, of people throughout the country. And, and, uh, and I love this photo. I just think it's gorgeous. Okay, so now, this is our Smith Tower view. And it was taken about a year before the tower opened. Uh, and we're, go ahead, Paul. 
just bored somebody, they just left. It always disturbs me when people walk out in the middle of a show. You failed them, somehow you failed them. I think it was the third vote. Well, I have a question to ask about that. Can I also make comments, or do I just get five comments all together? I've already done, made about 20, 30. Oh, right. That explains that, okay. So this is Frank Noel who climbed up uh, to the top of the Smith Tower observation deck before it was finished and shot through the girders, looking across Seattle. And this perspective had never been seen from this location. So for the first time from 2nd Avenue, and you can see this, there's obviously Queen Anne, there's Lake Union, there's our Wallingford in the distance. And what I want you to watch now is right here, there's the Methodist Church, and here's Rainier, right in the center, there's the Rainier Club. So keep your eyes on the Rainier Club, and we'll, and then you can look on the outskirts and, and see if you can find Lake Union today. Oh, wait, I think somebody's raising their hand and asking questions. Stand up, please. This will not count in my numbers. So I just wanted to know what year that last photo was. The last photo was, 1913, which was a year before the public could go up at the top and use the observation deck. So here it is. Watch, this, watch the Rainier Club again and then you'll see what's grown up around it. One thing that working on this book is, has, has done for us is it's certainly give us, given me in particular a sense over the last couple of years of how quickly the city's changing, how fast the landscape's moving, uh, and how important it is to, to document. And I found myself going back four, sometimes five times to locations because it was changing so quickly and I wanted to get the last publication before the, our, our final publication date. Well, this is the Monongahela escaping from Lake Union out from under the rapidly com completing George Washington Memorial Bridge. And uh, this foremaster had been in the lake for several years. It was already outdated. And when it left Lake Union, it ended up being sold off to a Vancouver Coover logging company. It survived a few more years hauling logs before it was scrapped. And today, we see our lovely structure. But, there's more to be said about the Aurora Bridge or the George Washington Memorial Bridge. And it starts with this telegraph key. And in 1909, President William Howard Taft was given this key by George Carmack, the man who first discovered gold in the Yukon Territories. The key was made of solid gold and adorned with 22 solid gold nuggets. And you can see them all around the outside. It's now in the Smithsonian, it's called the Taft Key. And the reason we bring it up is because it's connected to our story of the opening of the George Washington Memorial Bridge. <laughs> this is February 22nd, 1932. Huge crowds, thousands were waiting on the north and the south side of the Aurora Bridge. And they were listening to uh, a politician named uh, Roland Hartley, he was our governor, and they were listening to him after years of, uh, of uh, uh, what would you call it, Paul? He was I bitterly opposed. So, or start your sentence. So. Oh, Roland Hartley was bitterly opposed. He was the governor. He was bitterly opposed to the Aurora Bridge. He had big problems with funding of highways and uh, why was this, Paul? Why was he such an ass? <laughs> well, we speculated it was from, well, he was from Everett. <laughs> I don't know if I didn't do it. Anybody here from Everett? <laughs> Anybody here can defend Everett? Apparently <laughs> not, so that must, might have something to do with it. So, Governor Hartley was, after long, uh, rejecting to the use of, of state monies to build this bridge or to build any, you know, uh, to work on the highways. He stood and took full credit for it, a long, meandering political speech. 
And uh, the crowds, as they listened, he went on and on, and at, but at 2.57, uh, Herbert Hoover pressed the Taft key to set off the plumes of water from the fireboats below, and fireworks, and the flags unfurling, and the crowd streamed out onto the bridge, uh, cheering and interrupting Hartley's speech. That was a Republican countermanding another Republican. So, I mean, that was an intro for us that time, and that was tough, tough. Uh, and here we are today. And I actually found a wonderful photo of that moment when Hoover pressed the button, 257, interrupting his fellow Republican. You're, you're sure it was the actual moment and not a recreation? I, I, I can't swear to that part, right. but it's been identified as that moment. Well, some years later, the last time this, was, this uh, telegraph key was used, was to open the 62 World's Fair by John F. Kennedy. And here he is pressing it to start the opening ceremonies of the Seattle World's Fair. The first Seattle World's Fair in 1909 was also opened by Taft using that key. So here's Kennedy opening it. And now we have a little slide of the nine millionth visitor to the Seattle World's Fair. This is Paula Dahl carrying her nine millionth sign. She won the dog. Her parents are delighted and her sister is very unhappy. <laughs> and here she is standing with her elementary school class in Issaquah. And she still has this nine millionth sign on her wall. Did you visit the class when you were there? I did, I took the picture. No, I mean, did you go into the classroom? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we walked in and queried the students. And they were all impressed. Now we jump to the Seattle Fire, 1989. <laughs> this is one of the few photographs of the fire. Looking down First Avenue in spring, and here's the Fry Opera House, and you can just see a guy standing up on top of the fry. Everything in the foreground here burned. Paul guesses that there were so few photographs because most of the photographers we're, we're gathering their equipment and saving their, their negatives and their plates and their cameras. And here we are today. And in the paper, this was captioned, The Hideous Remains. You say in the paper? Yeah. In the, in the original paper that, in which this photo ran, they called, they called this picture two days after the fire started. So and this actually started. was published in the paper? It was. It was in the Seattle Daily Press. Huh? I don't know if I like you going out and doing your own research. <laughs> really? What do you have to do for me? I mean. It's funny. This is where I benefit from Paul's memory because this is directed from his column. <laughs> well, let's go to this scene today. And of course, what's, what's particularly fascinating is if you look at that structure, we all know what this is. This is the Pioneer Building, we're in Pioneer Square, and of course that's the sinking ship garage. Which is the sinking ship garage? Do they know what you're talking about? I'm pointing my laser at it. Oh, I didn't even see that. Yeah. Oh, okay. Buck, beg your pardon. Never mind. Mm -hmm. So if we go Never back, mind. you can see that that structure is yeah. the front of the what was once there in 89, the Occidental Hotel. And it became, many, many decades later, it turned into what we have now. But before it became the Sydney Ship Rush, they replaced that triangular building of with another hotel. And here it is. After the fire. After the fire. They rebuilt. And there you have the Pioneer Building here. And there's the Seattle Hotel here in probably 1908. And we go forward and you can see the sad diminution of the Seattle Hotel. 
Now, the one thing that uh, the one thing that was accomplished with this loss, of course, was the sense of the loss, the tragedy of the loss, which inspired any number of folks under the uh, leadership of Victor Steinbrook to save another institution, which which we may well have lost if we had not first lost this Seattle Hotel. Uh, the Pike Place Market was next to be to come under threat, and uh, so we had thousands of fellow citizens. Victor Steinbrook actually led the saving of the market. They were going to replace it with hotels, condos, apartments, parking places, another sinking ship. But one aspect of this that that Paul has often called attention to is. And I'm going to use my pointer as you describe this, Paul. Look at this, the sensitivity involved in the architecture of the sinking ship. <laughs> so I'm going to, I'm now circling the, the basket handle arches of the merchant building behind the sinking ship garage. And of course, the sensitive architects of the sinking ship replicated that. <laughs> that the actual architects of the garage pointed this out during the struggle to stop them. And that, oh no, you don't understand this. We are actually building the garage to complement the neighborhood. <laughs> so they were sincerely using that design as the apologia for building the thing. Well, you lose one now, you understand a little more about uh, about politics when you run into these architects squabbling with each other. Go ahead, James. Oh, I did. And so we're looking at, at what was saved. This is in 1907. And if we, uh, if we go there today, you can see this sort of marvelous, marvelous little street that is like a touchstone. I think as, again, as the city changes so radically and so quickly around us, there are certain places that we can go and find and measure ourselves against. And one of them, for me, is, is the market. And I think for many other people, too. Did you say touchstone? It is a touchstone. You remember which uh, English, Victorian English critic and author used that phrase in his aesthetics? No. William Arnold. William Arnold. You've all read William Arnold, haven't you? There'll be a test at the end of the show. Let's go ahead. I'm just showing off a little bit, I'm sorry. I did study English. Where are we now? If you've been following Paul's column, you probably know. What earth? I really did study English. <laughs> of course. You probably, know, you probably know where we are now. Oh. High five. There we go. So let's take a look. This is in the mid-50s, taken by Werner Lengenhager. I'll show you. And he was a Boeing engineer with a camera. And he wandered around. He knew that this was coming, so he wandered around these, these alleys. And we actually, in the book, we show the photograph that he took to the south here, and he took another one to the north, so we put them side by side. And I think one of, this one appeared maybe three years ago in the column. But that's a, that's a bit of a shock. How many of you are here for the building of the freeway? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 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 e
It's the post office. Here we have about 250 or 500 houses of shacks at Hooverville. And this was taken originally from the uh, third and fourth floor rooftop of the B.F. Goodrich building. And there is no B.F. Goodrich building there today, so watch Smith Tower, the Port of Seattle, let me get up on a hoist, and I went up 35, 40 feet in the air and retook it. But watch Smith Tower as it disappears and reappears. Turning back into a port, not far from where our books are right now. <laughs> Early 1940s. Do you want to give a warning on this or not? A, a trigger warning? Yeah. I guess we could. Maybe talk about this photo. Is it a trolley car or a streetcar? Well, we're going to take a vote again, since I've got two more votes to go, don't I? This is the second of them. All right. So, do you call this a, a trolley or a streetcar? Let's all those in, of, uh, in favor of trolley, raise your hand. So, the trolley. Raise your hand higher, please. All those in favor of streetcar, please raise your hand. Oh, uh, streetcar. Streetcar wins. wins. Now, Gene's going to tell us which is correct. Well, we've been told by the Streetcar Association that the streetcar is correct. Yeah. But this was taken in the early 40s by a streetcar driver who was also a photographer, and he was documenting the end of these streetcars because they were about to be replaced by buses with tires and gasoline engines. And all of those, unlike San Francisco, we, we got rid of most of ours. And today, we're back at the corner of Oh, I, should, I forgot to give the trigger warning. <laughs> this is, we're back at the corner of Fremont and 34th. And there are no trolleys in this photo. That was the trigger I wanted to warn you. Thank you. Uh, it's a wonderful city we live in. Wonderful place. This is a, uh, the Go Hing celebration. And you can see behind here this kind of marvelous lion dancer. And it was a, 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 a six-day festivity, that, a festival that went on, uh, and this was captured on the king. And I went back and found, uh, right near the Hotel Milwaukee, a couple doors down, the Seattle Kung Fu Club, which is led by, and has been since 1960, by Sifu Jung Leung. And he brought his students out with all their lion dancing costumes and parked in the middle of King. And here he is today. And there's John Young. And he too is 80 years old. This year. And I felt, we felt, I was a little worried that we were taking up the street, but this guy's a West Seattle cop. And he said, don't worry about it. <laughs> Falling there is it in, in, in uh, is just lying. 
dry in there, is it? I, I think that it depends on the um, on the amount of rain. I think precipitation increases. The, what happens then? It, it burbles up. We see little little bits of swamp. Is there a wetland? Wet yeah. Oh, okay. So here we are in Lake Union. It's called the junction, actually. The junction. You right. go south. Uh, you'll come across the junction before you get to what's the name of that town down there? Renton. Renton. No, not that one. Before Renton. Who? You have to speak up. No, it's not. The skyway's up on the hill, isn't it? Yeah. This is down in the valley. Right. Tuck 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 got it. Yes. Kill you. And you were going to win some kind of prize sometime in your life. <laughs> we don't have anything here. We have sincerity, though. Okay. So here's the, uh, the, the children of the Brown family. And these are the faces that sold another, oh, what, 50,000 books for Paul? This was yeah, that, cover. Was, that was what kept us alive, man. This was on the cover of his and first And you're going to do the same now for Gene and his family. And you buy several copies of, uh, what's the name of the book, Gene? I forgot. Clay, what's the name of the book? Now and then. Seattle Now and Then, The Historic Hundred. There you go. And here we are today. Are you in this room, Clay? <laughs> he is. It sounds like he's in the eye in that one. This is Tia and Liana Owen, uh, my neighbor children. It's a photo they took for the Moai show we did in 2011. And I brought them back earlier this year just for fun. You can see how they've changed in six years. <laughs> we always get that reaction with the Kalakala. How many writers on the Kalakala? How many of you have written? Well, this was a passage from uh, most likely a, a, a repair job in Lake Union back out to the Sound. And they filled up the decks with passengers. And you can see them in the windows of the Kalakala being towed through the locks. And I knew I had to go back and find some kind of equivalency there. And I, I kind of lucked out. And it was an inadvertent luck out because I went back in the spring of 2017 and they were bringing another boat through. And it turns out that this is the USS Turner Joy, which is a Bremerton Museum ship. And after I took the photo, long after, I came to understand that it was involved in a major incident in US history. It was the second destroyer to be involved uh, to, to go to the aid of the USS Maddox in the Gulf of Tonkin. And on August 2nd, 1964, uh, the Maddox was involved in a skirmish with North Vietnamese gunboats. And the, then there was a mythical second skirmish, which evidently never occurred, but upon which Lyndon Johnson got us into the war. And the Turner Joy was, was, uh, was one of the two ships that were most involved. And here it is off the coast of Vietnam. And there's something that Clay Eels, our editor, took a couple days ago of Looks in front like of Salties. Looks like a Danish cow. <laughs> With three eyes. So here, here at uh, the, the wheelhouse of the Kalakala still uh, sits now in front of Salty's. That's about all that's left. And uh, I think there's a drive train along to the left of it, but this is, and then he took it through looking at the skyline. And now we're getting closer to the, to things that will soon disappear. And here's one of them. This is in April, uh, not, not long before the opening of the viaduct. And someone pointed out that, it, that the concrete, the structure actually looks already, it looks a little bit uh, soiled and abused. And no car has traveled on it at this point. But we have these lovely models walking along 
We don't know that they are models. You mean, oh, you mean generally in the sense of models, yeah. yeah. Okay. But today, and here's where I want to call, so this is our Scotland looking about the same spot. But today I want to call attention to, you can see the Smith Tower, but here is the F5 building, that, that, uh, as it was being constructed, called the Mark. And the, the uh, Seattle developer who uh, encouraged the, the building of this building and turned it over to, um, he was inspired by a, uh, his name was Kevin Daniels, and he went to CGF Architects and in trying to articulate the qualities he wanted in a structure, he kept coming back to Breakfast at Tiffany's and Audrey Hepburn. So if you look now, look at the, look at the lines in the F5 building. This sits up above the, uh, the Methodist Church. And both Paul and I kind of like this building. And we've, we've discovered this story in a few weeks ago. We love it, Gene. We, we do. It. We really do. The sensitivity that was not present in the sinking ship garage is... So, here's the model for this building. <laughs> and while they were, while they were, it was under construction, they actually had a large uh, poster of Audrey Hepburn. And you can see that her angles and her cigarette holder, in a certain sense, reflect... <laughs> You'll, you'll never think of that differently now. <laughs> no, that's it. There's Audrey right there on the Seattle skyline. So we Is there do. a melody in breakfast? So, so, Tiffany, remember any, anybody remember a song from breakfast? What is it? Moon River. Moon River. Water than a tongue. Yeah, lovely. <laughs> this, this photo was taken of Green Lake. 1903 by Ash Curtis, and much has changed. You can't see. It. I got one more, don't I? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I would like us all to sing the first line of Moon Liver together. Okay. Are you ready? Let's get somebody give us a pitch.
So it'll be a lot of pictures with captions and also running text. So look at the, for that next year. And I got this picture and I included it in the Iver archive. And that's all now kept in a large, wooden, beautiful structure, which uh, I designed as it turned out. I didn't carpenter it though. And so that's the story of that. The history of this oldest house is that it was built by Doc Maynard in the oh, 1860s. Yeah. When he moved to West Seattle, traded his acreage in down, what is now downtown Seattle, left the other settlers behind, and went to West Seattle and tried to start a farm. I completely missed that part of the story, didn't I? He did. And nearly starved to death with his wife, Catherine, was not a great farmer. But this is the house that he built, and it was near the waterfront, and they moved it about a block up on 64th. And you can still see it to this day, and here are members of the Southwest Historical Seattle. And there is Clay Eagles. Where's Clay? He's Where in the picture. He? Where in the picture? He's on the far left. Far left. Yeah. Right. Distinguishing himself by a polar position. That's right. Down at the end of the street, they have a little plaque, but it doesn't actually direct you to the house itself. So if you want to see this very old structure, which is surprising because it's entirely made of wood and is not rotted away. And I, I posit, having seen some of these structures that were built in the 1890s, that Douglas fir actually lasts a long time when you're at the heart of the tree. It really does. When, uh, Clay, when was that plaque done? I don't know, Paul. I okay. think it was 20 years ago when they were putting plaques into Alki Avenue. There, okay. That's one of about 20 or 30. Wow. Speak up. Ooh, how is Ivar connected to oh, house? Oh, that's a good point. See, I completely spaced out on something else. And and that's age. I want to tell you that's age. Be careful. Okay, what, what that is, is that Ivor's parents and his mother was the youngest of the kids. They bought that house. It actually, it wasn't from Ivor. It was from the person that Ivor sold it to. But they had only had it for about an hour. This is in no, a year. This was 69. And so that's I that was right. Ivor's mother was raised in that house. So that's the connection. And that's his mother that's standing on the steps with her mother, Anna, and the guy in the long black coat. Is that up now, Gene? Yeah. That's the grandpa, that's Hans Hansen. And, uh, and, and there are other members of the extended family. Okay. Right. But in the 90s. That's the 1890s, you know. Okay, all right, very good. You have in your uh, Ivers book, you're going to have him. Oh, yeah, it'll be on the Ivers book for sure. Yeah, yeah, every, fact, everything will be. Singing yeah. with Crane Seal, <laughs> now by the you old know, fairy doc. Uh, speak up. Are you going to have him singing with his Crane Seal down by the fairy doc? Oh, that's in the book. I didn't hear him say, this is age. Age, can't hear very well. You're, are you going to have him singing with, with Patsy down by the docks? You mean, with Patsy the seal? Yeah. Yeah, you know. And selling his counter. Yes, that's right. I have pictures of him down there playing the guitar yep. by the opening. Yeah. I don't actually have a recording of him standing there. I have recordings of him singing the songs. But they were done either at his home or in studio. Yeah. So we have a lot of recordings of him singing. And the, there's a real misunderstanding about Ivor from his older years, is that he couldn't sing. But as a young man in his 30s and 20s, he had a beautiful tenor voice, a lyric tenor voice. And that comes over in these recordings. You can hear he had a lovely voice. So, well, and he would probably... He'd ask the seal to, to sing along, and go, or, 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 then he'd throw in a, a hunk of herring, and, do you remember that? Oh yeah, we used to well, then you I should be up here on the show and talk to Paul. You should be up here to reminisce about. I always reminisce. You call me up, will you on that? Sure. I'll call you. I'll go. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs>
Thanks. Do get a hold of me, will you? I'll give you my phone number when, when, when we're over here, okay? All right. I'll never it's stop researching. Never stop researching. Never stop. That's right. Okay. Well, here we are uh, with the last little bit of research. And this appeared almost a year ago. What a contradiction. With the last little bit of research in this show. Thank you. Here we are looking at Princess Angeline on her front porch somewhere below uh, the western and it was uh, it was not known exactly where that was until and i'm going to make this short call that's what i'm can, not going to do any okay i won't do any feather dusting or anything all right ron edge who's been a participant in the column for many years and a researcher and he actually triangulated uh, using a number of photographs and roof lines and tree stumps and comparing them all, he found pretty, he thinks he found the location where this shack was. And so we went down last year and I retook the photo with Ron sitting right about where Princess Angeline is sitting on her front porch. And what I appreciate about this photo is that it's the one green patch remaining between uh, Western Avenue and the waterfront. And on the left side is the Pike Place Market parking garage, and on the right side is the Fixed Medora building. And going all the way up this incline are bamboo shoots, uh, which just uh, have filled up the entire uh, path here. And the, the residents of the, uh, of the Fixed Medora use this as kind of their outdoor playground. And it's, but it's, it's closed off to it. Don't trip. Okay. So. This is about the end of the show, I think. We're, We're just coming about very to close. Would <laughs> you, you like to take a stretch now for the last 30 seconds? <laughs> oh, okay. So here we have Princess Angeline, or Kiki Soglu, once again, the daughter of Chief Seattle, and an inset of Chief Seattle himself. She's sitting on the corner of what is now uh, Post Avenue and, uh, and First uh, in what is now the market. Well, not quite first. Well, they can see in the photo. We're going to go. Yeah, that's First Avenue behind her. First Avenue behind her. Okay. All right. Here we go. What I'm going to show you now are two of the direct descendants of both of them. Oh. Same place. Same spot. On the left is Mary Lou Slaughter, who's the great, 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 great granddaughter of Kiki Sobu. That's right. And to the right is Ken Workman who's the great-great-great-great-grandson right. of Chief Seattle through his second wife. And Mary Lou is a remarkable cedar uh, weaver and makes, makes uh, hats and shawls and baskets. And uh, these are a couple of them that she made for, for uh, Ken and her to pose in. The, um, they look like they're from Central Casting. I know they do. Ken looks yeah. like, like the George Clooney version. George Clooney played Ken Workman. <laughs> and Mary Lou is 80 years old. I missed that so too. <laughs> She's as old as I am. <laughs> now, while we were taking this picture, uh, Ken turned around a couple of times and, uh, and Clay took a picture of me taking a picture of Ken and Mary Lou. And we spent maybe 10 minutes taking a series of shots in different positions, and taking hats on and off. And I saw Ken jerk around a couple times. And afterwards I said, Ken, what were you doing? He said, well, I don't know, but someone was tapping me on the elbow. And I said, well, there's no one behind you. He says, well, I can't explain it. I thought they were trying to pick my pocket. And so I think of this as those, the nudge of history, the skeptic that I am. Paul thinks of it as BS, but I <laughs> True. I think of it as... No, I don't, true, I don't take the nudge as BS, but the interpretation, the ghost story, BS. Did I say a ghost? No, but that's really what you're implying. <laughs> well, I, I'm happy to let... Uh, let Ken have his experiences. Well, I'm too. I'm too. Well, that's we, we didn't act this way in front of Ken, did we? 
Well, you weren't there, no. <laughs> Actually, I was behind Clay taking a picture of Clay, taking yeah. a picture yeah. of you, yeah. taking a picture of... Yeah. Actually, I think Paul was the one who was trying to pick Ken's pocket. Yeah. I could have been, yeah. All right, so there's the, the back cover of our book, and that's, that's the end of the show. Okay, Thank you all for coming. What's the president's name? Trump. What is it? It's Trump's new Justice Department. They're down there working on that, but they'll they'll get it. They'll let, we feel innocent. We'll feel they'll be all. <laughs> okay, I know you know your stuff because I heard you talking earlier about Ivory and songs. So let's let's just do a quick test here. If you if you are if there are more than twenty two people who want to buy books, or if there are fewer, we have no problem. If there are more than twenty two. Twenty three. Twenty three? Are you selling your own book, Clay? No. Okay. Look at Clay giving up his own book. How about can we hear it? Let's hear an applause for Clay. Thank you very much, Clay. You tell them they can get it in so, inscribed online. So let's see, do you what do you think, Liz? Are there I think there are probably more than 22. More than 22. Or 23, excuse me. Or 23. Yeah, I didn't actually count that. But they can get the... You can get it online. Jeez. What do you want, Paul? Well, we, we can send them books that are signed and have messages on them and everything. They just have to tell us what the message is. Yeah, well, it's true. But they can also take it home tonight. That's if right. 20, 21 of you or 22 of you or 23 of you. So, uh, so what I'm going to do... Embarrassing. Uh, I'm sorry. I don't know how else to do it, but we do have more than 22 here. So let's let's do a quick drawing. Pull out your red cards, and we'll go through them very quickly. Liz, do you want to? Boy, this is we we are important, aren't we? You have to have a drawing for our bloody book. That's, Should we release any? Uh, that's takers? impressive. <laughs> oh, these guys know how to play. What hucksters! Well, thank you very much, Tom. Let's give Tom a bit let's, of a. Let's find uh, out. Uh, let's give Tom a. Uh, this guy was, all the stuff you saw on Channel 9 for 20 years, he did it. That's Tom. He was in charge of, he was the head camera person at Channel 9 from what, the 70s and through the 90s? Well, it's true, he was my next door neighbor too. When okay. I did a, a... Can I stop you here for a second? Let's take care of business, then you can talk as much as you want. That's fine. Let's just do a quick raise of hands. If, there are, if, if you've changed your mind and you, you don't care if you get the book in a week uh, or you know, eight days or whatever it's going to be, uh, then feel free not to buy one tonight. If you want to buy one tonight and there's 18 of you, we're, we don't have to do this drawing, which Paul doesn't want to do. 
So raise your hands if you really want to get a book tonight and have Paul sign it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Liz is I, I think we're okay. I think we're okay. So if if, if you if the if those who raise their hands just come up and, and grab a book, I think we'll be in fine fat on the rest of the I would like you. you to get on the stage and put your hand in the pocket of the person that's in front of you. So we can keep you in order. All right, continue, Paul. So again, now um, that's a great question. I work for an environmental consulting firm. Uh, just short. Um, what happened to that person that was right, in this right, space? That I did happen to know, and I had been talking to you. Where did you go to college? Oh yeah. Um, I went to the University of Washington uh, and then to the University of Bath. You have a very wonderfully sculpted face. Look at that. <laughs> Perfect for architecture. Perfect for architecture. Well, thank you so much. I want to thank you. Thank you. I really enjoyed doing this. I'm going to go over here. I'm going to go over here. Send them away. Get out of here. I have a few more facts. I don't know if anyone can be interested in that. The late ladies. Gold Cup program, a great big uh, Sure, yeah. Now, when you say interested, you mean you want to sell them, right? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm giving them to the right person. I don't need to make money. So anyway, yeah. What's your name? Is this to you? Yeah, yeah Lauren. It's not like a girl. L A U R E N. L A U R E N. Okay. That's really my name, but I'm not a girl. I, the, I really enjoyed your presentation. No, you're not. You are, okay. Uh, I also have an original pocket you might guide for program for the oh. Century Press. <laughs> He's got that. And of the Caligraphy. Oh, that's uh, I'm, I'm thinking my answer would be, of course. Uh, 